So I'd like to structure today's discussion uh, along the lines of, um, uh, first we'll talk about your keto experience, which I think is quite interesting and, of course, very different from the situation we're in today. And, and then we can talk some more about the more recent developments um, with regard to North Korea. So to just start the discussion, um, maybe what you could do is describe initially your experience as Keto's first executive director and what that was like for you. Well, the agreed framework was signed in October of 1994, and uh, almost just a couple of weeks after that, I was asked by uh, the State Department, Tom Hubbard exactly, uh, whether I would be willing to take on the task of establishing and then directing the Korean Energy Development Organization. And after a bit of reflection, I agreed to do it on a part-time basis because I wasn't quite confident enough to leave the job I had, which was being president of the U.S.-Japan Foundation, to kind of jump off a cliff and take, off, take on this new task, this new institution. So I agreed to do it on a part-time basis for several months, but in any case, I was the first employee of Cato. Uh, the second and third employees were my two deputies, uh, Itaro Umezu, who was from Japan, from the foreign ministry, and uh, Youngjin Che, who was from Korea. So we had no office, we had no staff, we had no regulations, we had nothing. So we rented space in a Tempor temporary space in an office building on Park Avenue and moved in. Umezu immediately went out and started uh, rustling around looking for space. So within the next several weeks, the, the staff began to trickle in. We hired a few Americans and then the, uh, both the Koreans and the Japanese seconded people to Cato uh, coming from their own bureaucracies. And eventually we found uh, office space down on Third Avenue and we moved there and I think I don't think I don't think Cato still has any space there they may have a mailbox there I'm not sure anyway that's where we we were and soon after that I've had my first encounter with the North Koreans in contrast to other Americans who were involved in this I had not been involved in the agreed framework negotiations so my experience with the North Koreans was a kind of a baptism if you will uh, and I met uh, uh, with Ho Jung, who was my counterpart as the head of the North Korean negotiating team. We had our first meeting in Kuala Lumpur, uh, and we had all trekked out there and met and discussed what we had to do. We were really making it all up because while the agreed framework was handed over to us as a complete, completed diplomatic uh, document, it didn't say anything about how we were supposed to carry it out and implement it. And the first task was to agree with the North Koreans on exactly what we were going to do. We had, there was an agreement that the light water reactors would be provided and in very general terms uh, the technology was specified. But we then had to negotiate the details of what the technology would look like and how we would deliver these LNG, the light water reactors. So that went, actually, it was a very fascinating experience because uh, we were feeling each other out on all sides. Uh, the South Koreans and the Japanese were feeling us out, the Americans, not being all that certain about what the division of responsibilities was going to be like. And of course, the North Koreans were feeling us all out. And uh, it was a very interesting beginning for what turned out to be, I think, a uh, unique and to some extent remarkable exercise. Well, you bring up a, a number of different issues which I think are very interesting to delve into, and so why don't we take each one and... Sure. And, um, the first one is, of course, <clears throat> here you're establishing basically a new international or multilateral organization. Right. And so, to me, that's very interesting because all of a sudden you're throwing together Americans, Japanese, and South Koreans as the main players, yeah. and eventually more were added from other countries. Um, what, what was that like from the very beginning? And 
you know, describe, I think, the experience of trying to mold together people from these different countries into a functioning organization. It was challenging, uh, never boring. Uh, I, you, the big picture was one in which governments were supposedly doing all of this. But on the ground in New York, where we were, uh, we're, we're talking with people. People have to do this. And with very few exceptions, none of the people who were working at Cato had previously worked in a sort of collaborative team environment with people from the other countries. So it was a first experience for all of them. And one of the things we did early on, I, I decided that we were having a little trouble crossing cultural barriers. I mean, small things, for example, Everyone would come to work in the morning, and the Americans were all kind of ebullient and hail fellow well met, and they would say good morning to the Japanese and Koreans who were coming in, who couldn't understand why this greeting process was necessary every time we started a new work day. And so Americans were kind of drawing back, saying, well, they're not very friendly. So, so I found a, a couple of cross-cultural trainers in New York and brought them in, and they began trying to work on all of these problems. And I think everyone had tremendous goodwill on all sides. Everybody wanted to make this happen and to make it uh, truly collaborative and productive. But there, there were some of these cultural difficulties that, uh, in retrospect, uh, I think we worked our way through pretty successfully. And eventually we developed, my objective always was to develop a Cato spirit, a feeling that that the enterprise we were trying to conduct jointly was larger than the individual interests of any of the governments concerned. And I think for the most part we pulled that off. We had to contend frequently with intrusions from capitals, but we quickly developed a sort of ethos in which we were united against capitals because they were the guys who were trying to screw us up. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Most people don't understand that um, you know, with the exception of the Americans, the other personnel at Cato had to go back to their governments. And, you know, they kept very close ties with their yeah. governments. And so, you know, they were being told essentially what they should be doing by their governments. And at the same time, you're trying to develop this Cato perspective. Right. And that must have been an extremely difficult process. It was, process. as I say, like much, much of it, it was challenging. Uh, there were a couple of things I think that were critical here and barriers. One was that the Japanese and the South Koreans were convinced, with some reason, that the United States had brought them in in order to pay for American foreign policy. Uh, they were not participants in the negotiation of the agreed framework. In fact, they had to wait until the Americans and the North Koreans finished talking before they knew exactly what was being trans transacted. Now, they were aware of the goals, uh, and in general, they signed off on the, the process. But it was, uh, you know, it was an affront to their sort of sense of independence and sovereignty. Uh, so that was, uh, that was always a problem. The other problem was within the United States government. Uh, you may recall that three weeks after the signing of the agreed framework, the, uh, there was an election in this country in 1994, and the Republicans won control of both houses of Congress. Uh, and the Republicans collectively hated the agreed framework. They really did not want to try to negotiate with the North Koreans. They'd been opposed to that from the beginning and they were not of a mood to be supportive to the American engagement in Cato. And unfortunately, we needed things from the Congress, right. like money, because uh, the agreed framework was not self-funding. So we had to figure out ways to finance the heavy fuel oil that we'd committed to give the North Koreans. And then we had to go out and hire a contractor uh, who would actually be in charge of building the the, uh, the, the, light, the, the light water reactors. So uh, from the beginning, the American component at Cato was to some extent 
sort of not an orphan, but certainly was not nearly as tied into the bureaucratic process as was the as were the uh, South Korean and Japanese components. So meshing all of this uh, on a day-to-day -day basis was challenging. What was your relationship <clears throat> like with Washington? Were you getting instructions? Were you getting advice? Uh, not very much, no. Um, in, in, in one sense, that was good uh, because it left us free to sort of use our own judgment. Uh, in another sense, there were, there were times probably when we could have used more. But, you know, as is typically the case in the U.S. government, having negotiated the agreed framework, which was a major accomplishment, Washington kind of moved on. Uh, you know, Bob Gallucci left. <laughs> he went to Georgetown as dean. Uh, you guys who were deeply involved sort of went off and did other things as well, uh, or at least went back to your regular jobs. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of contact there. Tom Hubbard was there for a time, and then he left. Uh, but everybody was then worried about China and other things that uh, didn't really include worrying too much about North Korea. The assumption was, the, the operating premise was, we'd taken care of the North Korean problem. Now it was just a question of moving on. You know, one of, <clears throat> one of the things, well, there are a couple of more issues here that I find interesting. The first is that, you know, not only were we creating this new multilateral organization, which wasn't really big. I mean, I don't know how many people. No, very small. Very small. But secondly, the responsibilities were enormous. I mean, when you think about it, you were building multi-billion dollar reactors. And on top of that, you had your heavy fuel oil deliveries. And right. Those were the two main activities. So. You know, I'm interested in, in <clears throat> developing how you built the organization a little bit more and talk about, you know, how did, how did you gear up to do these things aside from having 30 people sitting in New York? Well, after a few uh, near misses, I think I concluded that this had to be truly a collaborative effort. And I was very fortunate in my two deputies each of whom were, was very, very competent, very engaged in the Cato process, and very committed to it. And they've both gone on to have very successful careers in their own governments. Uh, in fact, uh, Young Jin Che is just recently arrived here, as, as you both know, as the new South Korean ambassador to Washington. Uh, but I learned that I had to ask their opinion and actually listen to it and try to form a collective judgment. Uh, it didn't work for me to try to instruct them as to what we were going to do. You really had to build this consensus and you had to operate from that consensus. And whenever the consensus began to fray, you had to go back and talk more about what you were trying to do. It was time consuming, we worked long days, and it was occasionally quite frustrating. But I concluded that in the end, there was no real alternative. The United States was not, I mean, we could impose our views on the macro picture, but if we didn't have consensus among the three of us, uh, there was no way that this enterprise was going to ever do anything. And I assume part of that also involved you going to, to Seoul and Tokyo, meeting with government officials, right. trying to build your own separate relationships with them as well. Yes, and I, we went out there. I usually went traveled to an, Seoul with, with Che Young Jin and to Japan with uh, Itaro Meizu. Uh, and we spent a lot of time in both capitals basically negotiating with those two governments, trying to make sure that everybody was more or less comfortable with what we were doing. And in the case of both of them, obviously, the, a key question was not just the policy, but was the money, because we were relying on them to pay for this enterprise. And they had uh, their own concerns with their internal uh, finance ministries and all of the other people who obviously wanted to have a role in this. And 
I'm, I'm just curious, of course, looking back, when you visited Seoul, when you visited Tokyo, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everything wasn't, yes, we're 100% behind you, just tell us what no. you need. I no. mean, I'm, I'm curious about the interaction there and, you know, how they were reacting to this requirement that they lay out billions of dollars for, for this project. Well, their governments uh, had signed off on the notion, the general notion, but as they say, the devil is in the details, and the devil was present in all of this, in that you had to be sure that you had agreement on all of the, the major elements of the, of, of, of the project as you were moving forward. And both, in both cases, in both Japan and in uh, South Korea, perhaps even more so in South Korea, these were controversial things within the body politic. Uh, dealing with the North Koreans, as we were doing on behalf of South Korea, was a very delicate enterprise because you had to be very sure that you were not going too far and you had to be very sure that the South Koreans were comfortable every step of the way. I remember negotiating the supply agreement uh, one of the major considerations was how South Koreans and North Koreans would communicate with one another in the building of the light water reactors because KEPCO was going to be our prime contractor. It was their, they, they, uh, they brought the technology, they brought the, the, uh, the experience, the expertise, and so they had to be willing to deal with the North Koreans, and the North Koreans had to be willing to deal with them. And yet, formally, there was no way that we could write a document that had North Koreans coming into contact with South Koreans without the United States being there as the intermediary and basically the channel of communication. Now, I was fairly confident that once we got it all set up and began work, working, that that would become much easier. But in the initial establishment, of all of these processes and procedures, it was a real problem. 